but mornings just to be sitting at Jesus' feet. And we're so happy that you're here with us on Whispering Hope as we have our weekly Sabbath school review. And this week, we will be discussing extreme heat. Now, you may ask what kind of heat are we talking about temperature as it relates to the weather. So you got to stay tuned with us as we discuss this week's lesson, extreme heat. In our midst today, we have a wonderful set of people who will be helping us to unpack this week's lesson. And in the house, we have Elder Ronald Thomas, we have Pastor Cindy Lee, we have Elder Alson Jarvis, Elder Bradley Nunes, and I am your host, Mr. And so this morning promises to be an exciting time. We invite our viewers to share with us, to send your questions, to make your comments. We enjoy studying with you. But before we jump into today's study, we're going to ask Elder Thomas to pray for us to start. Let's go ahead. Just want to say happy Sabbath to everyone. Let's pray. Father, you're so great. You're so awesome. You're such a loving God. We're so thankful, oh God, for another day that we could just enjoy the rest that you have provided to the salvation that you have brought to us through Jesus Christ. We want to thank you, oh God, as we open your words that your Holy Spirit will build our minds so that as we speak, we will speak what you would want us to speak. It would be an encouragement to all of us and to those who are listening as we seek to understand the life experiences that we would have and how it relates to you building our character so that we would be fitted for your kingdom above. May your blessings be upon us. May your Holy Spirit attend this session, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And Pastor Lee, you up. Give us a synopsis of this week's lesson. Yeah, good morning, everybody. We are looking at extreme heat, and it's quite interesting to know that this week um, in the UK, they experienced the um, most, the hottest day. Sometime um, in the week, they experienced the hottest day ever. And um, as we look at extreme heat, we, um, we, it explains why pain and suffering is um, permitted and how the child of God can overcome evil. Now, just as the goldsmith uh, has to apply extreme heat in order for the gold to be refined, sometimes God allows the enemy, Satan, to bring extreme suffering into our lives in order to refine us. And so this week, we see some biblical examples, some, some examples of biblical characters who experienced extreme heat and how they overcame eventually and became awesome children of God. And we too can be overcomers, even as we experience extreme suffering. Well, I want to thank you, Pastor Lee, for giving us an idea what to expect this week. And so we begin by looking at our memory text. And it's taken from Isaiah 53, 10. It says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper his hand. Isaiah 53, 10. And so we're going to ask all of our panelists to comment on this text this morning. We're going to go in this order. Elder Jarvis, Elder Knowles, Elder Thomas, then Pastor. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's always a pleasure to be on this platform. Uh, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. You know, there are many of us who are very much reluctant to suggest that God will cause us to go through difficult periods. Um, God will allow us to be challenged. And um, 
we brought to, even sometimes we are brought to despair. But it's not because of our challenges, generally because of our personal perception and thought patterns. Um, however, when we look at the fact that God desires the best for us and he wants us to um, fulfill and reach our highest potential in him, he needs to use the necessary methods which will bring about that transformation in us. And if we are, if we would be open-minded enough, we would accept that these are what we call growing pains and they are needed and necessary to transfer us from this part of eternity to the next. Okay, good morning. Um, this is a very interesting um, passage of scripture. However, um, I want us to view it in the context of John 3.16. Because this is out of an act of love from God. For God so loved the world that he gave, that whoever believed in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So there was, there was a purpose that God had. There's something he had to Fulfill. However, having said that, though, let me interject here that um, we have to also accept the fact that if the, if the roles were reversed, if it was a father who had come, it would have been the same result, right? Because it's like father, like son. What drives the Godhead is actually love, all right? And so the focus is not on the pain so much but what's the, what the outcome is going to be. So all this was done so that we can have an inheritance, so that we can have eternal life. And so because of that, the, that's how Isaiah puts it, um, you know, it pleased the Lord because the, the outcome was going to be beneficial for us. Yes, and, and to, to add to, to what was said before, it is definitely something that you see um, where God, um, to Jesus Christ, to bring about salvation for mankind, it was necessary to go through the suffering and the pain that Jesus went through because the end result is, is glorious. I mean, at any time that we ourselves, we could understand that we, if we're trying to achieve something and, and we, we can see from beginning that this thing is gonna work beautifully um, to benefit others for whatever means that we might be trying to, to do whatever we're doing. Regardless of what it's gonna take, we know that we're gonna to have to make some sacrifices to get it done. But we can see the end result. It's gonna be beautiful. It's gonna be wonderful. And so we would not mind go through the suffering and the pain and the process of getting this thing done. And it, it, it's something like this. God recognized, realized that the end result of the suffering of Christ would have brought about a relationship with human beings, would bring us back to that point of relationship where he can then lavish us with all the wonderful gifts that he has for us. And so it, would, it pleased him to, to do that so that the end result would be the, best, the blessings for us and will show the goodness and love of God. Amen. Pastor Lee? Yes, um, this is one of the messianic prophecies that speaks about Jesus Christ. It shows that um, in order to effect it, our eternal salvation, that Jesus Christ too had to go through extreme heat of suffering for us. And so as a result of that, we have eternal life. And, you know, it brings to mind a Bible verse that tells us that he was in all point tempted as we are, yet without sin. And so his example shows us that we too, in spite of the extreme suffering, the extreme heat that we may have to go through, we too can be overcome. And then I want to thank everybody for your contribution. And so I just want for us to look at the introductory story on this week's lesson, Extreme Heat. Here is a Christian writer, famous one, C.S. Lewis, who went faithful to God, who have been writing about God's goodness. He's at a point where his wife is dying. 
and he is troubled. He said, not that I think he's in danger of um, not believing God, but he finds himself in a place where his perspective of God changes, where he starts envision, not this loving God that he's been talking about, but a God who seems to be so cruel in taking the love of his life from him. And, you know, in our walk with God, sometimes at our lowest, when we seem to be in extreme heat, now I grew up in a bakery, so I know what extreme heat means. And here was this man, his faith wavered. He, his mindset changed, his view of God changes because he couldn't deal with what is happening beside on in front of him. And so as Christians, when it seems as if God is pleased to bruise us, as this is referring to Jesus here, we have to hold on in faith, you know, to see God in spite of the difficulties and the crucibles. And so I want to ask this powerful question. We know our memory text focuses on Jesus and his ministry here. But I have to ask this question. Why did God allow his son, his one and only son, to pay the price for our salvation. I know some of you, when we were discussing the text, alluded to it, but let's bring it up. Let's bring out the PowerPoint. What is the motive? Why would God creator give us, allow his son to pay the cruel price, the price that we all deserve? Why did he allow his son to pay the price for our salvation? Again, we're going to say mother, Elder Jarvis, Elder Knowles, Elder Thomas Pastor why did God allow his son to go through difficulty? The fact is, sin brought difficulty. And because of the connection with sin, the path would not have been easy. The path would have been perilous. The fact of the matter is that we placed ourselves on a perilous journey through our four parents. And there was no method to get rid of the corrupter, the corruption, without someone facing the danger. And Jesus himself decided that I will face it for everyone. And he gave himself as the sacrifice. Now, if we are to consider what the sacrifice is, and in the process that a sacrifice is usually given in place of something. And in the context it is, is used, generally it's a matter of giving its life. So Jesus came and because of the corruptive nature of sin and the, um, and the severe nature of sin it had to have been difficult because everything that god had placed in the beginning had been removed the 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 the, the easy way so to speak the um the best course all of that left when sin entered so it just it's just the process that needed to happen it had to have been difficult because the issue of sin is one of difficulty. And that's why so many of us today still struggle with its effects and circumstances. Thank you so very much. And we have it. Yeah, um, in, the, in the context of the great controversy, right? I think that is essential to add to the conversation. Because here it is that um, God was accused of being high-handed and all these things and so on. However, God had to prove to the rest of his, the created world that the way he operated was on the basis of love alone. He never forced anything on anybody. It brought him to the point where he made a decision that he'd rather die than to lose any of us. Mm-hmm. All right? So whatever, whatever the process, whatever the process, whatever it took, God was willing Right. In fact, in fact, what makes it most striking is that the Bible tells us 
that before the world was even formed, he already made that decision that this is what he was going to do, regardless of what the consequences are going to be for himself. That was not about him because he didn't, he, not one selfish motivation was there where God is concerned. And so what it does for me, it makes me feel extremely humbled and extremely special that God himself chose to condescend, to come down, to be like me and to die the death that I should have died so that I may inherit eternal life. And I just want to give God thanks and praise for that. Amen. Amen. So before we move on to Elder Tom, so can we say that this extreme heat that we're discussing this week began with God himself who gave his son to die for us? I see Elder Jarvis nodding his head. Elder Thomas, go ahead to him. That's an interesting thought. Um, but God is a consuming fire, so I don't know what kind of heat, how much heat <laughs> <laughs> would be able to test God. Anyways, um, you know, uh, Paul said it nicely, Romans 6.23, that the wages of sin is death. And, and, and when man sinned, um, it brought about death, destruction, and separation from God. And the only way that uh, man could have been restored is coming through death. So somebody had to take on that, that death for, for mankind. And no sinner would have been able to pay that price. So God himself was willing again. The basis of all of this is God's love. So that it says that the end of um, the verse says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And so that's why Jesus as the son would have taken on the penalty of death so that man could have had that great gift of love to be returned to an ex uh, eternal existence with God. Amen. I wish to take us back to the um, sanctuary with its service and its services. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Just imagine a man would care for his animals that he loved very much. And then one day he had to take one of them and place it on the altar and offer it up as a sacrifice. And so we see here that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So God had to no, there was no one else that could have um, given their life for our sins. The angels could not have done it. None of us are worthy. And so God sent his son, his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for us because of love. As John chapter 15 and verse 13 tells us, greater love hath no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends because of God's love for us. He didn't want to risk any one of us losing our lives. And so without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So God sent his son to die for us so that we can have eternal life. Amen. And the underlying theme is love. God's amazing love. And so we jump to Sunday. Abraham in the crucible. And we looked at this last quarter, but again, it's back here for us to look again. And... We know the situation all too well. God calling Abraham to sacrifice his son. Now, question again, same order. What lesson was God trying to teach Abraham when he called him to offer up Isaac, his son? Well, first of all, um... There are many times when we imagine that tests are, um, are given for the examiner to know if you have received the principles of the lesson, whether you have learned them, you have absorbed them, and you are now able to um, even... suggest that you know what these principles are in various ways. Abraham was in 
this difficult situation because he was brought in the circle again to be tried to see if he had learned the lesson that was necessary. The first time he and Sarah devised a plan to help God out and that didn't work out so well. God gave him time and brought him around back to the same spot to determine whether or not he was going to leave it up to God or he was going to put a plan in place. Let's, 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 let's look at it from this angle. God gave him time. It took several days, three days, the Bible says, for, from leaving home to get to Mount Moriah. He had enough time to come up with a plan which would um, satisfy in his mind God's requirement and to satisfy God's promise of the world being filled by his seed. So here he was brought back to the point, back to the door. Abraham, are you going to open it yourself or are you going to allow me to open it for you? And when he got to the point where he decided, Isaac, if you have to die to fulfill God's word, that's what will happen. And he raised the knife to plunge into his son's chest. God knew that he, Abraham, had been, he's now to the place where he recognized that he's willing to trust God because it was not God's test for himself. God didn't want to know where Abraham's heart was. He already knew. Abraham just needed to know that for himself. Amen. Okay. Matthew 10, 37 tells us something important. It says, if anyone loves father or mother more than me, anyone loves father more than me is not worthy of me. All right, so I think um, this is so essential to what we're looking at here in, in the context of um, Abraham. What are you willing to put in front of? of God, because uh, many times even as parents, I know for sure that we would want to internalize, we'd want to think, uh, you know, over a number of times before any hurt could come to any of our kids, right? But here it is, um, Abraham was maturing in his walk with God, because he's a man who had made a number of mistakes even to, to the extent where he tried on another woman to get the promised seed. Now, now he has the promised seed. God moves in, in some kind of strange ways that sometimes we really don't understand. We can't internalize, we can't conceptualize. Because, I mean, it's one of the most, it's one of the weirdest things that God could have asked him to do. That was really barbaric. This is what the people used to do, offer their children a son as sacrifices. And, and here it is that God is saying, okay, even though it's a common practice and all these things and so on, it doesn't mean that I approve of it. But let me test and see how far are you willing to go if I put something to you. And, um, and, and we know what the outcome is, have not wanted to um, over speak because there are people to talk. And so, and, and so this is what I'm saying. So this is what I'm saying. It's predicated on love and maturity and trust and all these things. Amen. But before Elder Thomas comes on, we have a viewer who is commenting with us and I just want to share with us what she's saying before we move on. Um, I think she said, I thank the panel for this lesson. It has been strengthening her and she's blessed and highly favored and loved by God and she's humbled by these discussions. We want to tell Barbara Buckley, we appreciate your comments as well. And Elder Java, she says, she's agreeing with you. God always gives us time to God be the glory. So Elder Thomas, you may give us your, your thoughts. Yes, and um, you know, this is like, like, um, like perhaps um, Edson would say, this have a lot of gospel in it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we would not be able to exhaust it. There's a lot of gospel in that little, uh, that little uh, experience with Abraham. But it, what is interesting, one of the things that's interesting in it is that 
here it is, and sometimes we might find ourselves in the, we could find ourselves in the same position where um, we know that we would have been struggling with um, something that we wanted God to provide for us. It, it, it is um, important to our success in whatever area, whatever field we might find ourselves in. Um, it could be education, it could be to pay for, or for college, um, it, it, to get a degree, it could be almost anything that it actually becomes what our, um, the, the, the thing that will actually make our life according to what we desire and according to what God has promised. But here it is that uh, when we get that thing, we, we can become so absorbed in that thing that we can actually forget that God is the one who gave it. And, and, and Abraham um, would have been um, at a point where he would actually want to idolize, as it were, Isaac. God had to bring him back to reality. <laughs> I am the one who is going to bring about what I said I will bring about. It's not because now you have it that it's okay, you can, you know, put him on this particular place. And so God had to bring him to that place to come back to decide is, is, is a decision you have to make. Are you going to let me do what I said I will do? Or are you just going to hold on to this son that I gave you <clears throat> for your own glory, for your own desires? What are you willing to do at this point? And so sometimes God would bring us to that place. Are you going to give up this job or this whatever it is that, that you know that I am the one who gave you and it, it's about your whole life? But are you willing to give it up to allow me to see, to show you that it is me who is going to provide and really satisfy all your needs? And so I think the test um, was somewhat like that for Abraham, as it would be um, for us. Amen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, the experience was for Abraham as was brought out. He had to exercise faith in God. He had to go through um, crucibles for his faith to, in God to mature. We, we know that Abraham, God called him as the, the father of the nations. And God promised that through Abraham, all the families of the earth should be blessed. And so God wanted to reveal to him the, plan, the father of all nations, the plan of salvation. And by so doing, God was revealing to Abraham what he, God, went through when he decided to give up his son to die for us. God went through crucibles as well. He suffered just like Abraham suffered when he had to make that decision to give up his son. God had to make a decision to give up Jesus Christ. It was a struggle. He too went through crucibles. And so as the father of the nation, Abraham was put through that test to show him that the plan of salvation is a plan that was laid down in sacrifice. It was not easy, but it was because of his love why he did it. And it was because of Abraham's love for God why he decided to offer up his son. Amen. So we can all say Abraham had some extreme heat as he dealt with his crucible, but we're moving on to another one. Where were Israel? And I'm so happy this morning that men outnumbers us because the first set of questions are trying this one out. So we're looking at the story with Hosea, right? And so question up for these three men first. Pastor, you hold your thoughts. How would you respond if God said to you, Elder Jarvis, Elder Knowles, Elder Thomas, you have Wendy's, you have Bruce's, I don't know the, any other names at the point, and you have to go down there. And I'm telling you which one. Diamond eyes. <laughs> Diamond eyes. Lord sending you there. He said, I'm choosing a wife for you. Tell me. I'll be honest with you now. Talk to me. You know, this woman, she's not virtuous in any way. You've had so many lovers. Her, her, her past is so sordid. Tell me, I begin with you, Elder Jarvis, Elder Knowles, and then to you, Elder Thomas. How would you respond? What do you think God is doing here? Y'all talk to me. 
Uh, first of all, I would say that um, God will not give us more than we could bear. <laughs> uh, secondly, secondly, um, I, I have an acquaintance who um, finds delight in uh, visiting those places. And the, the other day, after, after hearing him talk to um, some of the other guys on the site, um, I asked him a question about um, why, why, why do you feel so comfortable um, in places, in, in that sort of environment? He said to me that for him, it's about companionship. And it's amazing that these women, many of them are functioning in this capacity out of a need. Um, they may be facing a difficult situation, um, maybe back home and they need to do something and they feel that this is the best course that they could take. But they're human beings, he said. They too are, you know, they need love, affection, to be thought of more than just um, a transaction. And in it, he finds that because he thinks about them as more, it's easier for them, for him to develop some sort of relationship that is um, what I should say communal, one of a community, friendship, um, you know. So he, he is in a situation where because he has developed a friendship with many of them, when they have their personal issues outside of the clubs or the, their env work environment, they would call him. And I was really struck with that whole idea because the fact is they are human beings and we as Christians are called to look at them as more than just what they do, because they too need Jesus as well. Um, I just want to bring up because it really was it really was an eye opening conversation that I had, and it brought about, um, at least for me, some level of catharsis which helped me to alter my perspective. And I thank God for that conversation, really, because. It is one that we as Christians need to have because we generally see people in degrees of sin uh, as we see it and forget, sort of overlook, gloss over the fact that all of us are in need of salvation. But the issue with Hosea, that was, that was a peculiar one, but um, <laughs> God uses unique ways in, at so many times, which baffles us. Um, but let's just trust God, um, no matter what the challenge is. Amen. All right. Um, permit me to use a caption for two movies. One, the gods must be crazy. <laughs> and the second one, different strokes for different folks. Um, it's interesting how God functions, right? Because God knows and he understands us very much. Okay. Um, I am not sure if I'm as mature as Jose was at that given point in time to be able to just walk in and say, let me just take that and run with it. However, the ideal thing is for us to listen when God speaks, no matter how strange it is. Because listen, in the context of um, us, let me talk about us as seven Adventists. Many of us, we tend to be more dedicated to Adventism than God, right? So if God was to call us to do something that is unsabbatical, 
we wonder if God must be bonkers or something, right? And um, and so we made uh, we make religion so more popular than Jesus Christ. However, what the Bible tells us that what we should do, Solomon tells us that that we should fear God and keep His commandments, for this is our whole duty, right? And so this is what I'm saying. So we 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 obey God not because of how we rationalize it, but we believe that God has a purpose for our lives and he knows what is best and he knows the things that are going to help us to mature, to be able better to endure because, I mean, this, this, this is strange. And as, as you would notice throughout the Bible, you can't get two more stories like that. There can only be one hose here. I can, I can, I can go out on a limb and tell you that. <laughs> Yes, um, <clears throat> I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing here because it's, it's really interesting. But um, I, I think if, if I was to answer the question that you asked, I, I would probably say to God, well, the one that I have is the best one that I could have. And I, I, I would not be able to manage another one, especially <laughs> that one. No, but, I mean, uh, in terms of finding a wife, not getting <laughs> your, your young man looking for a wife in the state of Posey, your elder, your pastor in the church, and God is telling you, that is the right. one to do, Elder Thomas, not asking all you right. to be a yes, wife. Yes. I mean, that would be a tough decision. That that would really take some agonizing. And, and like, you know, Elder Don't say, does know what position Posey was in in terms of his maturity, uh, how uh, quickly he would have moved on, on what God said. And so that definitely would take some real serious thinking and perhaps like Gideon putting a, a fleece, you know, you know, before God and, and checking it and, and turning it all over the place and asking again and so forth. But however, um, what, what I draw from that is that the purpose, the purpose for it is what is interesting because God wants to give a message to his people. And, and in order for the prophet, remember, he's a prophet. Mm -hmm. so, so based on, on the position of the gifts that God gives us, uh, if we're going to carry a message, it must be a heartfelt message. Uh, a message like that could not just, Jose could not just carry that message. He didn't want Jose to just carry that message like word of mouth. He must carry it out of an experience that he had with God. And, and even as we preach as preachers, sometimes we might preach about things that we believe, but we have not experienced. And, and, and but when we can preach out of our experiences, it's, it's power, powerful and with conviction. And so the message that God wanted to give to Israel had to come with that kind of level of power and conviction from the prophet. So the prophet is not just saying what he believed, the prophet is saying what he knows about God and he's coming with this strong conviction. So God put him through that so that he would be able to give that message with the kind of, of um, with, with what it takes coming from God so the people could hear the heart of God speaking through Hosea. So at times God would give us experiences that when we begin to, to, to speak to people in their condition, we're not saying, we're not just trying to comfort or sympathize, we can empathize because we have been there and we know what God has done for us to bring us out. And so that message to that person will become the most valuable message because it will be coming from the heart. Amen. And Pastor Lee, this question is up for you. What lesson can we glean from God calling Hosea not only to marry a prostitute, but You're um, about that, yeah. So, personally, this question is for you. What lessons can we glean from God calling Hosea not only to marry a whore, but to take her back after she has been unfaithful in the marriage and after she has had outside children? Not only did she cheat, she also had children that were not Hosea's children. What's the lesson? So partly this one is for you. What's the lesson that God is trying to teach Israel? Yeah. 
It reminds me of a passage of scripture where God says, how can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I um, give you up, O Manasseh? My compassion grew warm and tender. My heart recoils within me. It shows how much love God has for us. We may, and, and um, in our context, we have heard God over and over again. We have run after all kinds of love. But God is willing to take us back and to restore us to um, being his. Not being just any old person, but being his. He loves us so much that God is willing to take us back. And when I consider that, it just tells me that God is such an awesome God. As the men just explained, they would not be willing. It's not easy for them to go down to Wendy's or Bruce's or Diamond Eyes or wherever to pick up a prostitute, although some of them, they did not really come here because they want to. It's because of human trafficking. And um, they don't really want to do it. But, you know, they think that they would not feel comfortable doing that. But God, God doesn't love when we have other relationships with him. And he loves us so much that in spite of the fact that we go out and we get tied up with other men, Spiritually, we go after other lovers. God is willing to take us back. Thank God for his love towards me because I've been running around with God so many times. I have cheated on him, but yet still God has taken me back and restored me. He blesses me and thank God for his loving kindness towards me. Amen. Time is of essence. We are running, but we gotta move. Surviving through worship. And this is a story about Job. The life of Job is one truly with crucibles upon crucibles upon crucibles. You know, we, hold, we know the whole book in one, not even a day, in less than maybe two hours. Job would have seemed to have lost everything. He began with his donkeys his oxen, his sheep, his camels, then his children. And then, you know, so a beginning here. So this question is for Elder Jarvis and Elder Knowles. Two questions in one. Why did God call attention of Job to Satan? And why did God allow Satan to test Job so severely? So you two will do those two questions for me. And then I have a question going for... Elder Thomas and Pastor. Well, first of all, I would like to say that imagine with me that God prefers to give the control of the earth to an errant human rather than to give it to Satan. Because Satan came when the sons of God from the other worlds came to represent this world. Satan came among them. And God asked, where are you coming from? Who are you? Where, where, where you want? And he said, well, the earth is mine. They come from walking up and down in it. Remember Adam gave it to me? God preferred to ask him about Job. Have you considered Job? And Satan said, Job doesn't fear you for naught. Because you bless him, and because he increased him, and because he has everything going on for him, that's why he behaves as if he prays in you. That's why he's behaving as if everything is fine. That's why Job can be pretentious in his Christian experience. It's not for naught. And you have shielded him from me. That's what Satan charged God. You shielded him from me, so I can't touch him. But... If you would just touch him, you will see what Job is made of. And you will see that this world is mine. That was the conversation. So God said, go ahead. I don't do evil, but you do. Go ahead. Touch him. And you will see. Now, here was the entire universe present 
every one of the other worlds witnessing this play and counterplay, this action on behalf of the earth. Sinful man over a wicked devil. And God was willing to place his confidence in sinful errant man rather than yielding the world to Satan. Imagine, that's, that's, that's marvelous. And to watch Job enter, this, enter his crucible and he moves and shifts as things happen. And he suggests that his faith in God is unrelenting. And he continues to move and shift as his situation changes and becomes more dire. Till Satan says skin for skin. What will a man give in exchange for his life? The ultimate test. And God said, go ahead. But you can't kill him. So Satan devised the worst possible disease he could touch him with at present. If he had minions to come up with something diabolical as COVID and other things mixed together, I think he would have done it. But he gave Job the worst that he could manage at that particular point. And still, Job passed his test what a confidence that God had in his creation Amen. I don't remember the second question why did God allow Satan to test Job so severely oh, I think I answered I think, it kind of answered. <laughs> I think I answered both of them yeah. yes you answered both of them Eleanor's Yes, um, as I look at the story, um, I wonder why the pronunciation is Job instead of Job, you know? Because when you look at the whole situation, the arrogance and the pompousness of Satan himself, figuring that he was the smartest person in the entire universe and to tell, telling, telling God things that he know weren't exactly true because he must have known about Job based on his confession. Okay. Um, but the, the elder has already highlighted this. So I didn't regurgitate what he said, but let me just shorten it because um, what I find to be interesting about this whole thing, right? Is that even Satan, as even wicked as he is, had to obey God. When God spoke, he had to obey all the big bars and pompous that he thought that he was. God said, don't, don't, don't take his life. And he had to obey. Mm -hmm. Because even his life is in God's hand. And he knows that. Right? And so, and so it's, a, it's an admission. It's an admission that he fully understands who God actually is. And God is really the true and the supreme one. Because, because tell, you, know, you put that head about him. Move, remove the things from there and you see what happened. Right? So he's now charging God of being this kind of person who is partial in the way that he deals with things, all right? And so Job is being rewarded because Job is close to him. But God is saying, no, 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 that is not the way that I actually function. Let me show you that there are individuals still in the world who has integrity, individuals who are not concerned about material things, individuals who would rather trust in me completely, though the heavens may fall. Right, and so even Job, even Job at the end was able to say, "Listen, I know that my redeemer lives. That's what is his focus, and he shall reward me when the time comes. The chancing things are not really what matters most to me." And that was an in your face to Satan, even though the man didn't know what was going on. They were in your face, so you can take that, you can brush off and move on, because there's no way that you're going to ever win this battle. And I'm wondering if, um, if we were to be tested if we would come out as pure gold, as um, Job did. This is something for us to, 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 to ponder, right? Because God is good, right? And everything that he's, he does is to fulfill his divine purpose and for our best good. Thank you so very much, 
Elder Nose and Elder Jarvis. I wish I could give everybody a privilege to speak, but time is running away from us and I wish to get to the two other days. So this question is going out to Elder Thomas and Pastor Lee. How did Job respond in all this turmoil and an application? What would you say to somebody who seemed to be in Job's experience? What would you say? All right, um, you know, uh, it, it, it's so interesting. Um, if you just permit me just a little bit to speak from the perspective of, of the crucibles that we, we, we find ourselves in and the, and the context of the, the whole study, it, it, the crucibles come to, to perfect us. It's, it's to bring us into the image of, of Christ. It, it, what is interesting about Job's story, what we didn't hear before about Job is, is how God brought him to perfection. Because the story begins by saying, hey, he, he was perfect and he was upright. Mm -hmm. so his crucible was not to bring him to perfection. So, 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 so look at it this way. Um, in today's um, context, even in a blacksmith context, they, they, they are methods that are used, that, that they're processed in a particular way for a particular purpose. So a metal might be processed to take um, a thousand tons of pressure on it at whatever point. And it, is, it goes through that process. But when it is finished and completed and it is perfect, it must be tested. So, so we, we pick up the story where here Job is now has come to the place of perfection. He must be tested as to whether or not it can really be this pressure. So God is boasting on Satan where Job is concerned. And, and, and I think that God would bring us, would want to bring every one of us to that same position. When we have gone to certain crucibles, when we have gone to certain things and are tested and are now perfect and, and are made perfect, then we can put, we are put in the position to which God really want to use us. So God knew that, that Job was at this point but the pressure has to come to bear. And as was said earlier, um, the, the, there is, God doesn't give us more than we can bear, basically. But Job responds, and this is what God wants us to respond to, because in, in Job's maturity, Job responds with worship. And, and that's how God would want, when we get to that place where God wants us to be, then regardless of what the crucible is, regardless of what um, the pressure that comes to be on our lives, we would then resort to worship. That's how we should respond. So anybody who would be going through um, any sort of crucible, what is it that God, is it that God is trying to bring you to perfection? Or, or is it that uh, in an area of your life, you would have already reached maturity in an area of your life? Now you must demonstrate the kind of power and strength that God gives to us when we get to that level. So in other areas, in different areas of our lives, we might reach to a level of maturity, but the test must come for us to demonstrate and Satan must know, Satan must know that, hey, look, doesn't matter what he chose at us, at this particular point, we have now been matured here and our response would be to trust God completely. And so like Job, we would say, the Lord give and the Lord take, blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen, amen. The Bible tells us that in all his suffering, Job worshiped God. He surrendered his will to God. Now, the Bible also declares that what was written a full time was written for our learning. We through the scriptures could find hope. So we have examples like those of Job and others as we go through our crucibles to show us that um, the trials of our life, we are precious. Job did not know what was happening in, in the picture, or we know that it was a part of the great controversy. And so God was there boasting on his servant, Job. And here was Satan. God had permitted him because Satan cannot touch us unless God permits it. And so God permitted Satan to touch him in order to prove that Job was a true servant of God. In other words, Job was being vindicated. Not only God was being vindicated, but Job was being vindicated. And um, also we see here that God doesn't cast base metal, as Ellen White tells us, doesn't cast base metal into the fire. It is precious ore that he refines. So if God is allowing 
as to be refined by trials, it is showing that you're not ordinary, you're extraordinary child of God. And so God is allowing the enemy to pour on pain, to pour on suffering, because you are um, precious in the sight of God. Thank you so very much. Well, before we move on to Wednesday, surviving through hope, um, Johnson Thomas, sorry, Johnson Joseph says, God is showing us the magnitude of his love and forgiveness. So thank you, Elder Johnson Joseph, for sharing with us. Surviving through who? We all know the story of Paul, his conversion, his Damascus Road encounter. And we see that the Lord transformed him into an emissary for him. And so the text on the Wednesday comes from 2 Corinthians 1, verse 8 and 9, and it says, We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. What this happened, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who is the day, surviving through whom? And so the question I'm going to throw out to everybody, two of them one time, what are some of the crucibles that Paul endured and what lessons can we learn from Paul's life? So the other Elder Jarvis, Elder Knowles, Elder Thomas, Pastor Lee. Well, some of the things that Paul endured, I just want to highlight two. The turning the, his brethren, who he considered to be his brethren, turning upon him. And the second one, what I find, what I found was rather unique. When he was shipwrecked on this island and there were serpents on the island, you know, um, Paul faced this challenge and his faith really was evidenced in every moment that he he went through these things um <clears throat> for me the 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 essence of all of these and um Basali just indicated um what romans and first corinthians spoke about all that is written aforetime it's really for our benefit for us to be able to evaluate and recognize that the consistency that God has established. And when he brings us to the place where we are able to respond in faith in like manner as everyone else that we have read in scripture has done, we too will see the blessed ends that God has in store for us. Amen. Um, let me say this. I find Paul to be a very interesting character because throughout the Bible, I've never heard of anyone else who said that they glory in trials and tribulations. I've never come across anybody with that kind of attitude for those things. It seems almost bizarre. You know, interestingly enough, um, the, the Bible speaks about Paul is saying that um, some agent of Satan buffeted him the thorn in the flesh you know and some time ago i this the term i decided let me go check and see what buffeted actually means and when i check buffeted it actually means to punch somebody in the face right angrily punch someone in the face i'll say i wonder, I wonder what paul was going with this thing can you gonna tell me somebody that keep on coming punch you in the face and you you can't resist if, if if that if that is the case because this is a modern way of looking at, at things i don't know what it was meant back then but if, if, if we're going to get real and bring it to our present situation somebody keep on coming punching you in the face and all you hear from god my grace is sufficient for you it has to be tough to um to deal with and so the number of things that he went through however however let me say this let me say this i think one of the things that i'm um, one of the driving and motivating force for uh, paul in my own estimation is the fact that he was a, he was a persecutor he knew what he put people through and how people stood up for their faith. And so out of that experience now, that was able to plant the seeds in his heart to be able to be determined 
that he will go to just like Stephen. When he stoned Stephen, Stephen saw, say he saw the heavens open and saw doors. That kind of experience would be a driving force for him to want to continue down to the very end, to just keep on trusting God no matter what the situation is. Yes, um, surviving to hope. Uh, I think that text earlier was such a powerful text. Uh, we, and, and Paul's experience was so many, beaten so many times, and even stoned and, and, and left for dead and so forth. Um, but, but he was a man who was certain that what he was doing, it was God's will. And, and so he recognized that, that these um, troubles, these, these challenges that he had to face, these trials that he had to face, was because he was in this great controversy. He, he knew where he was, and, and, and that is something that sometimes evade us. We're not sure what our purpose is. We're not, we're not sure what we should be doing. And, and so when the challenges come, we, we don't really, it's not really clear where it's coming from, why it's coming. Um, um, is it coming to help me or to hinder me? Is it something for me to, to help me to grow? Or it's something that is just the enemy is just trying to hinder me from getting to where I need to go. Um, uh, so, so we, we have these challenges from time to time. But Paul knew his purpose. Paul knew what was happening from his conversion. And so, so, so when he recounts these things, he was recounting them as looking as where God has brought him from, how God has brought him through. He recognized it's, it's only God, it's God who has been doing that. And even to the point of death, he had that hope that God could raise him back from the dead. Um, I, I, he understood that. So, so it, it didn't really matter that he was beaten how many times. They would have to, they would have to kill him eventually. Um, his mind was made up already. You would have to kill me eventually because I'm not, I'm not going to stop. I know what my purpose is. I know where I'm going. So you can't stop me. And, and I think um, that is the point, again, to which God wants to bring all of us. Um, to understand our purpose, uh, what he's using us for, what, what he's, and so all these things are going to come upon us, uh, uh, come against us, because for one, we've been tested, for two, we've been able to prove who God is, that he is able, and for three, our purpose, when his purpose is fulfilled in us, millions, I mean, from Paul's time up to now, millions have been brought to salvation because of Paul's experiences and how he how God brought him to it. So people are going to be brought to conviction, to conversion, to salvation. How we are able to respond to the, the, the challenges that, that God would allow us to go through because his purpose is being fulfilled in us. Amen. Yes. Um Paul was stoned, and um, when I when I think of Paul being stoned, I think of what he allowed to be done to Stephen. And sometimes what we go through, sometimes Satan uses us against each other. And sometimes what measure we meet unto others, it is measured back to us again. So sometimes some of what we go through are consequences of what we have done, but it's all in the intent that we be refined. And um, I like the part of the text that says that, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raised the dead. And so the crucibles that we go through, they to remind us that we should not rely on ourselves. We should rely on God. Some of us, as we experience um, victory through Christ, sometimes it gets to our head. And we have to be constantly reminded that um, it's not about us. It's not within ourselves that we overcome. It is through God. And so sometimes these crucibles from time to time, they come to us in order to remind us. And I thank God for reminding me sometimes too, because as a human, I too, sometimes like Paul, these things get to my head as well. And so I want to thank God for the constant reminder that I need to rely on him. And so the crucibles are very important.
Amen. Before we move on to Thursday, we have some comments coming from the chat, and I just want to share what our viewers are commenting and are saying. Ella Johnson Joseph asks, why Job? You know, um, Lucy Celia says, there's nothing too hard for God to do. The answer is no. What seems impossible with man is possible with God. But he knows what is best for us. Joy Charles says, you know, same question came to mind as L. Jonathan, why Job? And um, Lucy says, very true, amen. Joy Charles says, yes, Elder. I, mean, I think she means Elder knows here. Um, even Satan is ob obedient. He obeyed God when God told him to do. Holy to Joseph, a very powerful submission on this point, Elder. Thank you for your ministry. The Kevin Stone says, in the context of Wednesday's lesson, who is best positioned to comfort the breaded, the divorced, the unemployed, the one who has been through the crucible, or the one who hasn't? So that question is for you, all of you guys. I am just, what's, I'm going to read that question again. He asks, who is best to comfort people who are going through crucibles? Somebody who have never had an experience or somebody who has? Who wants to answer that question? Let's go to unmute um, that tell me. I'll, okay, I'll give you your first of all. Well, I think I think that the Bible explains it uh, clearly that um, as we see the experience, as we witness the experience by reading them, um, we can find hope. And it's it seems to suggest that the most competent and qualified ones to offer help to those who are going through are those who have gone through. Because I really cannot, um, I really cannot guide a person on a journey that I've never been on myself. I can't take them to a place that I don't know how to get there. So really we, we, we need the benefit of the experience going through and get it out on the other side because some people have gone through and they're still lost within it but gone through and gotten through on the other side to be able to tell someone exactly what they need to do in trusting god and following his leading to get through on the other side thank you very much i see elder knows and elder thomas and pastor lee they're all unmuted so we're going to say about it elder knows elder thomas and you pastor lee okay um Interesting enough, I would never sit back and allow an atheist to ever lecture me about God. Okay? Because he's going to be the worst person in the world for that experience. However, let me say this though. All right? Um, we, can learn, we can learn from anybody. Okay? As long as God is in the picture. As long as God is impacting the life of an individual, as long as the person is filled with the Holy Spirit, God can use anyone as an agent to bring peace and comfort, no matter what you may be going through. Even young ones can do those things. You don't have to be full of experience, right? Right? I'm not answering what, what I said before, cold water in it, but what I'm saying, you don't really have to be fully experienced in order to give good advice to be warm. What I think is most important is whether or not you're led by the spirit of God. And if you'll be able to be used effectively and efficiently as a mouthpiece for God to bring comfort and so on in the time of need, in the time of trouble. Thank you so very much, Elder Thomas and then Pastor. Lee. Yes. Yes, and um, let me try to be short. Um, basically, anybody is, uh, it, it, the question really asks, who would be best out of, out of two um, situations? Um, not suggesting that, that both would not be able to encourage, but it is asked, who, is, who would be best, the person who had gone through something like that or the person who had never gone through something like that? And, and the obvious answer is the person who would have gone through um, a situation like that, especially a person who would have gone through it and would have learned um, and, 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 and trusted God and recognized where God has led them, how this thing plays out and how God 
play God's role inside of it because one could be bitter and and so what they learn is not really what God wanted them to learn or, or what they take away from the situation could really be something that would discourage somebody rather than encourage them so so it's, it's a point of a person who would have been able to appreciate that through their situation God had worked for them and so second Corinthians um, um, 1 and verse 4 it, it continued from what was before said who comforted us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted by God. So the bottom line is that when we can find, when we would have found comfort in our tribulation through the scriptures, to the experience of, of those who are in the scriptures, we now are able, the purpose for that is that we are better able to comfort others who would be going through the same um, troubles. Thank you so very much, Elder Thomas. I'm constantly agreeing with um, Elder Thomas. I just want to add a passage of scripture found in Hebrews 4 and verse 15. It says, for we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, what was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. So yes, anyone can comfort anyone, but when you have been through the experience, it's you have your experience to share and to comfort someone who's now going through that particular situation. And I do believe that sometimes God allows us to go through a particular situation in order to help somebody else. Amen. No, I would really like to wrap up here, but we have to hit Thursday on the topic of this week's lesson, extreme heat. And it takes us to Isaiah 43, 1 to 7. And I'm reading from the King James Version. It says, but now thus says the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him. For my glory, I have formed him. Yay, I have made him a whole mouthful. And in closing, all of you are just going to tell me, what do you understand by this text? And what picture is painted in your mind when you read Isaiah 43? You know, the water is not joining you and the fire not touching you, you know. Talk to me. So again, we got on the same order. Jarvis, Snows, Thomas. Um, very short. I'm just going to regurgitate a statement that I've heard an individual made for a number of years. If I go through hell with a gasoline suit on, as long as I go with God, I'll be okay. Trust in God. In the name of Jesus. Anything can be accomplished. All things are possible. You know, the, the fire, it, it didn't say um, if you go through, um, if you go through, but it's basically when you go through. So, so the, <laughs> we're going to have to go through stuff, but the promise is I will be with you. It will not kill you that, I mean, nothing can prevent God's purpose. And so it's, it's a matter of being strong in the Lord, being courageous, trusting God, because he is able, he has promised to bring us through whatever the situation might be. 
it doesn't matter what I go through, God's abiding presence will be with me. And um, going through the fires and the waters, etc. This physical body may be consumed, but as Paul says, um, for I know in whom I have believed, and I'm able, and I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him. So though this physical body might be destroyed, yet in my flesh as Job said, shall I see God, and not the face of another, but God Himself. Amen. We so want to thank everybody this morning. We've had a wonderful session. We are always over time here. But I just want to leave it to all of us here at Whispering Hope Land. Extreme heat. You're in an extremely difficult situation. And like the Hebrew boys, you may be tempted to think that Nebuchadnezzar has torn that furnace seven times off. But guess what? Right in the midst of the fire, with the Hebrew boys, was God himself. So are your crucibles unbearable in your mind? Look right next to you and you'll find your anchor. You'll find your support. And most of all, you'll find amazing love that was poured out to you. So we just want to welcome and wish everybody a happy Sabbath.